this next component talks about how it takes a village. We have to all work together, families, teachers, and communities. When we think about working together, we're really talking about putting together all of the principles that we've talked about so far in the course. We have complementary and reinforcing worlds of children. We have home, which is, of course, the most important environment for children. And we have school, and school is a deeply meaningful area for children also. We know that what we do in schools makes a difference. It, it helps to support the home, it helps to support families, and it certainly helps to support children. And of course, we're all embedded in our communities. We're impacted by the kinds of things that are going on around us. We avail ourselves of resources. We're impacted by difficult things. Both families and our schools um, are deeply impacted by the community. So that's important. We talked earlier in the semester about Bronfenbrenner's theory of ecological systems, which we'll take a look at in the next slide. So this is straight out of our second lecture. And um, we've said that this is one of the more popular theories used to study child development. And something that I would want you to take away from this course is to think about how children in the middle are so deeply impacted by all of these other things, by home, school, neighborhood work, and so on, that interaction, by the mass media and the workplace of, of their parents, because you know there are these tremendous indirect effects. Um, widely shared cultural values, beliefs, and customs. And then in the middle, where we make the most difference, we've got that child, and we have us, the school program, and we have the, the home, and we have the neighborhood, and we have each of these layers of the environment interacting with and influencing all of the other environments inside of it. So when we think about it takes a village, what we're really saying is that children do not grow up on an island or in a bubble. They grow up with all of these different things impacting them. It's not just um, their parents, not just us, it's not just their neighborhood, but it, it's all of these things. It's even, you know, even the mass media that, that, you know, markets to them and makes them feel like they have to have that Happy Meal toy. All of these things have a tremendous impact on children and on families and on us, too, on our school practices. We've seen over time how... Um, political um, impacts, uh, you know, political things impact our schools. So, for example, we have the increased emphasis on school readiness and a whole body of skills that children need to have when they arrive even in kindergarten. Well, that's a political change that has impacted what, we've, what we do in schools greatly. And then, of course, that impacts the child and it impacts the family as then we change our educational practices. So what we're really saying here is it doesn't happen in a vacuum. It happens with this incredible interplay between all of these different areas. Here's another way of looking at it. It's kind of similar. You can see that we've got the child in the middle and we have all of these different areas coming together. The media and the community and the school and child care and peers and, um, and we have these um, kind of indirect effects that are around the edge, like the social services um, that people have access to or not, and the workplace, and school boards, and community boards, and federal and state commissions that impact our wider policies. And then we've got, you know, kind of our other things sort of in the, floating around in the middle, but they're always with us, and they impact everything else. They impact the child, they impact the family, and school, and child care, and peers and media and community and all of that, and it has to do with our um, economics and our culture and ethnicity and our science and technology, our political ideologies, religion, all of those things have an impact on the child, and we just want to remember that. Okay, so um, other things to think about when we look at how it takes a village um, as we think about corporate involvement, one of the things that we've been talking about in our society is having employer-supported child care. As um, folks are working, their kids need to be somewhere. And when we have um, places where you've got child care at the workplace, then that's something that we call corporate involvement. We also have advocacy organizations that advocate for things like flex time or... Um, you know, having more workplace child care available and things like that, that's, that's another example of corporate involvement. And we're also seeing that parental leave and support for parents when they um, have, you know, when, when they have children or just even when things come up with the children that they've already got, 
that those are aspects of corporate involvement. Why does the corporate world get involved in child care? Well, because of course they know that it's going to make a difference for them too because um, when folks have fewer child care concerns, they tend to be more productive at work, they tend to be happier at work, they tend to stay longer, and that has an impact on the corporation's bottom line, and so it's to their advantage to also advocate for families in that way. Here are some examples of legislative initiatives that may have an impact on families. Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, TANF, is um, the portion of um, what we call welfare, the um, PRAWARA is the Personal Responsibility Welfare Opportunity Reconciliation Act of 1996, um, is widely known as welfare reform. And um, one of the provisions that was written into it is that TANF, which is cash assistance, would have certain provisions in included in it. And one of the requirements in order to receive TANF is that you have to work. That is a requirement of TANF. It has been a requirement of TANF since 1996, and, um, and cash assistance also is time limited, so um, you, you can't receive it for longer than five years in your whole lifetime anyway. Um, so there's a work requirement and a time limit, and but these are legislative initiatives that have impacted early childhood programs because, of course, if folks are required to work, um, then they the kids have to be somewhere and also within um, welfare reform there was there's also a provision written into it it's the child care development block grant fund and it's associated with TANF and basically that means that there's subsidized child care um, available there's usually a copay that parents have to pay but some folks are able to access that the waiting list is really really long in any state um, there are always fewer slots than folks that qualify uh, for such a program but in any case um, that along with TANF those they're kind of wrapped in together um, are legislative initiatives that have um, certainly made uh, a big a big difference and they make a difference for providers too a lot of times providers have to decide if they're going to take child care development block grant money because the state will usually pay less a lot less than the going rate so if you take a child who um, is who qualifies for that program and let's say you would charge a hundred dollars a day the state usually is only going to pay 75 and then you have to decide well am I willing to take this child or would I rather fill this space with somebody who can afford to pay and pay a hundred dollars and these are issues that um, for-profit um, child care settings and um, family home child care providers have to deal with all of the time it it's it does it is, it's complicated um, and then the Family Medical Leave Act is also a legislative initiative that has impacted families and has impacted child care settings also. Um, we're guaranteed to have 12 weeks off if we want that after the birth of a child or to care for an immediate family member who's ill, but it's not guaranteed to be paid. And so then these are also things that families have to, to think about and negotiate. They, you just guarantee you won't lose your job for those 12 weeks, but there's nothing that you know guarantees um, anything about the financial component of that most child care programs will not take a child younger than six weeks old so parents are you know sometimes will return to work sooner than that 12 weeks um, and then the no child left behind act um, changed how we assess children's performance K through 12 and um, kind of changed the uh, qualifications of the professionals that are educating young children and that has had a, an enormous trickle-down effect into early childhood because again we've said well if children need to get to X spot by the end of kindergarten then they probably need to come into kindergarten with a certain body of skills and if they're coming into kindergarten with a certain body of skills then who's teaching them that stuff well early the early childhood education program is who is going to do that Okay, so other things that we look at in terms of providing programs that are helpful for parents, if we're saying it takes a village and that community programs are very helpful, here are the seven attributes that we would look at that we would say would make a program, a community program, highly effective. So the first one is that highly effective community programs are comprehensive, flexible, responsive, and persevering. 
In other words, you don't just come in and say, this is how we do it, this is what we offer, this is the way we offer it, live with it. Um, it's flexible, it's responsive to what the parents say they need. If they say they need food in order to come to a meeting, then you find a way to do that. Whether it's asking parents to bring volunteer to bring food, whether it's finding money in the budget to provide some small amount of food, whatever it is, you're responsive to these kinds of things. Um, even if it's just as small as a logistical thing like that. Also, highly effective community programs see children in the context of their families. And we've talked a lot about that this semester, and I deeply hope that that's something that you take away from that. Highly effective community programs deal with families as parts of neighborhoods. So wherever your setting is, you have to think about, well, where am I? Am I located? Am I on a military post? Because that might be really different than, let's say, out in the middle of the country somewhere or in an urban environment downtown. We, we don't just see it in isolation. We say, well, wherever we are is nested inside of something bigger. We have a long-term preventative orientation, a clear mission, and we continue to evolve over time. In other words, we don't just say, this is the model we set up in 1984, and we're going to stick with that because we set it up then. It can, it's continually changing. Populations change. The needs of parents change. Things change. And this, um, this attribute deals with that. It deals with the fact that things do change. Highly effective programs are well managed by competent, committed individuals with clearly identifiable skills. In other words, folks come in and they um, are able to say, well, I have enough experience and enough knowledge to know what's a good way to handle this. Have staff who are trained and supported to provide high quality responsive services. Staff training is an important part of any, com any community program, any child care setting or any other kind of community program. If you, if you don't have um, strong staff training, staff development, then what happens is staff will feel overwhelmed and they won't, they'll kind of not know and, and they'll, they'll feel like, oh my gosh, I have this problem, I don't know what to do. But if you have ongoing staff development, then you kind of learn, okay, well, when this comes up, here's something you could do. Or here's something that we're seeing a lot of lately. This is a way we can handle it. Um, highly effective community programs also operate in settings that encourage practitioners to build strong relationships of mutual trust and respect. We've talked about that a lot this semester. And I would say, out of all of these things, Gosh, you can, you know, some of, the, some of the other ones above it will come to you if you focus a lot on building strong relationships that are mutually respectful and mutually trusting. We also want to think about the community, the community as education resources. Um, we have lots of um, resources around us. We have the natural resources of places around us that we can, um, you know, access for the good of our, of our kids and our programs. We have the resources of people around us, these parents that we build relationships with and other teachers. We have material resources in any program that comes in. It comes in in different ways in different programs, but anyway, we do have material resources that we can access. And um, making linkages between programs are very important. As I said before, to think about connecting folks with programs that we need, that's part of using the community as a resource, too. So if you know that you have a, um, let's say, a family in your setting that would really benefit from having access to um, mental health counseling on a sliding scale, you would want to be able to connect them to those resources. So the next thing that we want to think about really is advocating. Teachers and parents need to be advocates. So what does this mean? It means that when we have a concern about something that we think is best for young children, that we make ourselves visible. We make ourselves known. And we say, this is what we think is best. And this is really important. And this issue has to be addressed. We want to be informed on what's going on. Are there things happening that are going to impact families and are going to impact children in your communities? We want to know about them. We also want to tell our stories. We want, you know, the, the stories that you have about the families that you work with and the children that you work with are very important. Um, and you want to make sure that you are addressing that. And um, 
You know, it can be big stuff and small stuff. Uh, for example, I recently advocated related to the school start time at my children's school. It, I, I wasn't enti you know, I wasn't entirely successful in um, my advocacy efforts, but I wasn't entirely. Um, some some things did get shifted around too, but I thought that that was important to me, and it was important to me because of what I felt was good for for the children, not just my children, but all children, and also how it was going to impact our family to have our school start time change. And that's, it's an important thing to do. And, and you know, I, at least I can say I tried. I told my story. I said this is, you know, I, I was informed on the issue. I made myself visible and known. I contacted the people in my community that had the ability to make decisions. Um, and at least, you know, at least I did something. Advocacy is empowering because you'll know that you're doing something. Um, your advocacy efforts, you, you adapt them. So thinking about if something's not working, trying to adapt it um, in a way that makes it more, you know, meaningful or powerful or replicating efforts. Um, that, that do work, that's helpful. Sometimes if you find out that something was really successful in another community or nearby, you could model their strategy in terms of um, advocacy. Join professional organizations. It's very important in terms of understanding what the issues are and knowing who to talk to about your concerns. Because the next point, connecting with the community power structure, is really important. It's, one, it's, it's all well and good to complain to your next-door neighbor. But if your next-door neighbor doesn't have any power in the community, well, then it doesn't help you. But on the other hand, if you figure out who's, who's a decision maker here, who's someone that can actually make a decision. If, if I at least send my letter related to this issue to this person, Maybe it'll make a difference. And maybe if I tell other people to send a letter, then that'll make a difference. But again, you have to think about who has, you know, who has power to change this. And do contact your representatives and vote. I have done this several times. I've written letters about something that I you know, thought was important to me. And OK, maybe it was just one lone voice in the wilderness. Or maybe it was one out of 600 letters that all said the same thing. Well, I feel like my one of 600 letters that all said the same thing makes a difference because then that person cannot ignore 600 letters. But if, if none of us would have done it, if we would have all waited for somebody else to do it, then we wouldn't have had 600 letters to begin with. So I do think that contacting representatives is an important issue related to um, advocacy. And, you know, of course, if you work in early childhood education, You've got to feel like the most important people for whom we advocate are our most vulnerable. There are families that have young children. There are the young children themselves, and that's really important. And finally, of course, an important aspect of advocacy is voting. So um, I think that these are really important things to think about. We want to make a difference. We want to be heard. Finally, it takes a village. It takes all of us working together in the ways that have been described above in order to um, make a difference with children and families.